Let's talk about a trig. There will be a lot of like break and then That is not a question I know the answer to. Um, what I would say is there might not be a lot, but there will certainly not be none. Right. So it is something we need to know. Um, and here's what, so here's what I would say in general. We need to be familiar with the graphs of the trig functions. We need to be familiar with how to evaluate trig functions. Um, but I don't want to spend all of our time doing that, but we'll spend some more time doing that. So one thing, let's talk first, let's we'll try some things here. Let me get a little situated here. Right on. So here's 15A. It is October 24th. Rigonometry. Um, so someone had asked, and I was briefly glancing through your reflections. Um, and it's often say trig this, you know, sine, cosine graphs, all the graphs, inverse trig, how to, what's sitting you know, radians, degrees. Let's start with radians, degrees, and then we'll kind of move on to the trig graphs. So, what is a radian? Well, first of all, what's a degree? A degree is something we just made up, right? A circle has 360 degrees because 360 is a convenient number. It's very divisible by a lot of things, and it also is close to the number of days in the year. So it seemed like a good choice. So when we talk about have, uh, looking at the circle, we can think of the circle having an angle measure of, I'm always with the smearing here, 360 degrees. All right, one full rotation, 360 degrees. But there is another way of thinking about, actually there's more than one way of thinking about angle measure, but the other kind of way we typically use in calculus is a measure called radians, which don't really have a dimension or a unit associated with them. So you know how like, kind of like you measure something in feet or in inches? Well, radians are it's called a dimensionless unit because there actually is no feet or any kind of thing associated with it. And we'll get to that in a minute here. Um, so let's talk about what we know about radians or uh, the circumference of the circle, actually. One way to calculate the circumference, let's say this circle has a radius of, I don't know, let's pretend that's like two inches. How will we find the circumference of the circle? Well, there's a formula for it. It's, um, you know the formula? You know the formula? So the circumference of the circle is two pi times the radius. Which in this particular example, the circumference would be two pi times two inches, which is four pi inches. Again, just making up numbers here. Oh, it's like about two inches. Okay, whatever. So what I want to point out is when you talk about an angle in radians, you are literally talking about how many radii are on the circumference of the circle or on the 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 arc of the circle. So if you go one full circle length, one full circumference here, the length of the circumference is exactly four pi inches here. So welcome, welcome. So the angle for one full revolution is of course 360 degrees, but it's also well, one full revolution in this circle I've drawn is four pi inches. That's the length of the, of the circumference. And we're going to take that length and we're going to divide it by the length of the radius because that's going to tell us how many radians or radius lengths that circumference is. Well, we're kind of just doing the work we already did. If you take this circumference length that we found of four pi inches and divide it by the length of the radius, which is two inches, we get two pi. And notice that the inches cancel out. So this angle measure all the way around the circle is two pi radians. So it is true that an angle measure of 360 degrees is the same as an angle measure of two pi radians. Because literally, I'm gonna try and draw this, never comes out super great, but I'll do my best here. The idea here is essentially that length, which I'm trying to draw so you can see it, this length here is one radius. So this angle is one radian. 
And if I go another radius length, I get another radian. If I go another radius length, you get my picture. This is where a picture starts to fall apart usually. I get another radian. So there's one radian. This angle here is two radians. This angle here is three radians. And again, I know they don't all look the same. Four radians, five radians, six radians, and a little bit more, about 6.28. So one full circle, one angle of the full circle is 360 degrees or two pi radians. So let me draw another picture here. Just so everyone's super duper clear what's going on with these radians here. That's kind of a circle. Well, we'll buy it for oh, I think I have some circles already. No, I already have some circles here. Did I put them somewhere else? Oh, I might I might have some circles pre-made ready to go. We'll use yeah, let's be smart games. We'll do some circles here. So here's a circle, beautiful circle, perfect circle. And what I want to point out is this is the length of the radius. So if I take that length and bring it up onto the arc here, this is one radius length. This angle is one. That is the whole idea behind radians. Yes. Like theta. So typically, so so theta is like x. Theta is just a name that we give the angle. So we could say that this angle is theta. Theta is one radian, but you can also call it alpha or beta or gamma or really any lowercase Greek letter is a typical choice for an angle name. So we just said that the whole circle, 360 degrees worth of angle is the same as two pi radians worth. And the way we know that is because we know the formula for the circumference of the circle. The circumference of the circle is two pi times the radius. So going all the way around the circle gets you two pi radian lengths. But then we can divide things, right? We can say, 180 degrees, if I divide that by two, I can divide that by two, and that's pi radians. We typically don't write the radian because everyone just knows when you're writing the angle of pi over two or pi over three or pi over whatever, that the angle is measured in radians. Um, if we divide it by two again, 90 degrees is pi over two radians. So this angle right here, this angle of 90 degrees is equal to pi over two. We often start labeling things up here, like here my angle is 90 degrees, which is pi over two radians. And pi over two, like we actually think about the number, pi is about 3.14. You divide that by two, it's about 1.57. And oh, that seems reasonable. This is one radian, there's another a little bit more than half a radian. That seems like a reasonable angle measure for this. Questions so far, and really you all should, this is the, the today is going to be like probably the only day we really spend any time, any significant amount of time really talking about trigonometry. So today is really the day to ask your trigonometry questions. So questions about radians so far. I will mention one radian is approximately 57 degrees. So that angle there, when I look at one radian, I really think of it as being pretty close to 60 degrees. So one radian, you kind of get six of them in a circle because you get six 60 degree angles in a circle, but really there's a little bit left over. So a little bit more than that. All right, so, 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 so how much trigonometry are we gonna talk about here? Sure, let's talk about how we evaluate trigonometric functions. Let's, yeah, let's use my, so glad I have all these circles here. It's just wonderful. So when we talk about evaluating trigonometric functions of an angle, we are typically doing some thing like this. We're saying, here's our angle theta, and we are dropping perpendicular to this x-axis, always to the x-axis. And I'm thinking of this being a unit circle, which means the radius is equal to 1. So this length here is 1. And we're thinking of this side length here being x, this side length here being y. And this point here being x comma y. And then we're going to do some right triangle trigonometry. 
where we use everyone's favorite mnemonic device. So, ka, toa. To say that the sine of that angle is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. Did I say this last class? It's okay if I did. I'm just, okay, it's good. It's good to see it again. It's not bad to see again. I'm just, sometimes I forget what I've said in each class. So the sine coordinate is just the y value. I should say the y coordinate is just the sine value. And similarly, cosine of that angle is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is going to be just x. So this coordinate here really is cosine theta, sine theta. And you might be asked to evaluate sine or cosine or tangent or cotangent or secant or cosecant of a number of different angles. So let's kind of talk about how we define the rest of these trig functions, and then we'll talk about how you can evaluate them. So I'll point out that tangent of theta is the opposite over the adjacent, which is y over x, which is also noteworthily, noteworthily sine theta over cosine theta. So now I'm thinking about my trig functions. I've got sine, cosine, and tangent. And then the other three are the reciprocals. So I would point out that we have sine of theta, we have cosine theta, we have tangent theta, which is equal to sine over cosine. And then the reciprocal functions, the reciprocal of sine is cosecant. It's equal to the reciprocal of sine. The reciprocal of cosine is secant. It's one over cosine. And the reciprocal of tangent is cotangent. And it's equal to either cosine over sine is one way of writing it, but you could also write it as one over tangent. And technically, although it seems a little bit weird, but it is totally normal, I could also write that sine is equal to one over cosecant and cosine is equal to one over secant. And tangent is equal to one over cotangent. So every trig function has a reciprocal trig function. Sine and cosecant are reciprocals. Each one is the reciprocal of the other. Secant and, co and secant and cosine are reciprocals. And of course, tangent and cotangent are reciprocals because they have the same kind of name. One way to remember which ones go together is tangent and cotangent always go together. And then every other pair, you have one co-function that starts with the, the prefix co and one not. You have sine and cosecant. You have cosine and secant. So one co, one not. One co, one not. One co, one not. It's useful, actually, because the co-functions have, there are some special things we will observe when we start talking about the derivatives of the trig function. Specifically, the co-functions all have negative derivatives, which is kind of nice to remember. OK, so somebody might ask you at some point to evaluate these trig functions, meaning someone might ask, and I don't think I want this, I don't think I want this, circle paper anymore. In fact, my other paper. Someone might ask you, let's keep things in order here, to find, I don't know, find sine of pi over three, cosine of pi over four, tangent of five pi over six, stuff like that. Maybe, no, it's totally fair game in this class. Someone could ask you to, for example, here's how someone could ask you to do this. Someone might say, find the equation of the line tangent to y equal to sine of x at x equal to pi over 3. And then we definitely need to know how to find sine of pi over 3 and also cosine of pi over 3. Because the way you find the equation of a tangent line is going to be y minus the y coordinate equal to your slope times x minus the x coordinate. And all we have right now is the x coordinate. For the y coordinate, we have to find sine of pi over 3. There's a number of ways to do this. You can memorize the unit circle. That's totally one way some people do it. It's not the way I have chosen to do it. I typically, when I think of sine of pi over three, I think of a right triangle. So there are two special right triangles that you may want to memorize. Here's one of them. It's your 30, 60, 90 right triangle, or as you might say, although it's more of a mouthful, your pi over six, pi over three, pi over two right triangle. 
pi over six is 30 degrees, pi over three is 60 degrees, pi over two is 90 degrees. So in this right triangle, while the where this right triangle came from was really by taking an equilateral triangle and cutting it in half, an equilateral triangle, all the side lengths are the same. That is literally what the word equilateral means. All the side lengths are the same. So if I said this side length was two, and this side length was two, and this bottom side length was also two, then this thing getting cut in half would mean this bottom side here was actually just one. And then I could use the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing side. One squared plus that missing side squared equals two squared. So the missing side squared equals four minus one. So the missing side is equal to the square root of three. And then if I want to find sine of pi over three, it's going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. That's going to be the square root of three over two. And just to kind of, we'll come back to this question, but just kind of add to the list here, we could say that sine of pi over three is the square root of three over two. Cosine of pi over three is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is gonna be one half. Tangent of pi over three. Now there's a couple ways to think about this, tangent. You can think of it as sine divided by cosine. That's a lot of fractions though. Root three over two divided by one half. Or you could look at the triangle here and say it's gonna be opposite over adjacent, which is root three divided by one, which is what you would get if you did root three over two divided by one half because the twos would cancel. I almost never actually think about the other three trig functions in that I know I can find sine, cosine, and tangent, and then I can find the other three just by finding reciprocals. I'm not really thinking that cosecant is, well, cosecant is hypotenuse over the opposite, and then I'm going to get two over root three. I'm thinking cosecant of pi over three is the reciprocal of sine, which is two over root three, which some people would prefer you rationalize. You would multiply the top by root three and the bottom by root three. So you get two root three over three. So if somebody ever asked you to find cosecant of pi over three, I would never find cosecant of pi over three. I'd be like, well, sine of pi over three is root three over two. So then cosecant of pi over three is the reciprocal of that, which is two over root three. And then usually we rationalize because that's standard practice. Yeah. How would you know that um, like the 60 degree angle is pi over three? So, so we have to we have to be comfortable going back and forth between radians and degrees. And the way you can change from radians to degrees is by multiplying by the conversion factor. So let me ask you a different question. And then we'll I'll, don't worry, we'll come back to this question. I promise. How would you convert three feet to inches? I mean, what would, well, okay? What would you, what's the answer? Three feet is how many inches? Right, thirty six inches. But the way we actually do this mathematically is say, well, I'm going to take my three feet and I want my new units to be inches. So I have to multiply by what? Well, the only thing I'm allowed to multiply by is, without changing anything, is one. I'm going to multiply by one. It's going to not look like one. I'm going to multiply by 12 inches divided by one foot because that's my conversion factor. I know that 12 inches equals one foot. So this fraction, even though it doesn't look like it, it is equal to one. 12 inches equals one foot. So then when I multiply this, the units I don't want cancel out. I'm left with three times 12 inches. In the same sort of way, we can take our 60 degree angle and multiply by a conversion factor. Well, I know back on page something over here, I said that 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. That is how we convert. You can either say, 180 degrees divided by pi radians, which I'm not gonna write, is equal to one, or pi divided by 180 degrees is equal to one. So I'm starting with 60 degrees and I'm gonna convert it to radians. I'm gonna multiply it by the thing where degrees is on the bottom and radians is on the top. So if I take 60 degrees and multiply it by pi radians over 180 degrees, the degrees cancel, you get 60 pi over 180, which reduces to six pi over 18, which reduces to pi over three. So long story short, to convert from degrees to radians, we multiply by pi over 180. To convert from radians to degrees, you multiply by 180 over pi. 
it would, I would say it's, it's definitely, I would expect students eventually to be like, oh yeah, pi over three is 60, pi over six is three, which is kind of annoying, right? You wish like the three would go with the three and the six, but they don't, they go opposite. So pi over three is 60 degrees, pi over six is 30 degrees, pi over four is 45 degrees, pi over two is 90 degrees. Those are the ones you probably want to know kind of off the top of your head. Um, to finish off this little part here, secant of pi over three is just the reciprocal of cosine of pi over three. So it's going to be, I'm just going to flip this fraction over and get two over one, which is just two. Similarly, cotangent of pi over three is the reciprocal of root three, which is one over root three. And then we would rationalize that as well. Multiply by, I know I didn't show it before, multiply by root three over root three and get root three divided by three. I would say it is probably not unreasonable for someone to expect you to be able to find any one of these trig functions of this angle or two other. So let's go through the other two important angles that I think we should know. And then we'll talk about kind of an easy way to remember. Them. So yeah, let's talk about, let's talk about the other one that makes sense. So in that same triangle, we have one of our other special angles. So we have, pi over three down here, which was 60 degrees. We had pi over six up here, which is equal to 30 degrees. We had a 90 degree angle here. When you draw this, if you draw this 30, 60, 90 triangle, the sides are one, two, and root three. Some people, you can do it differently. That's the way I like to do it. And I always remember that the smallest side goes opposite the smallest angle. And the biggest side goes opposite the biggest angle. And the medium side goes opposite the medium angle. Is root three the medium side? Is the square root of three between one and two? I think so. Right, let's see. I could write this. One is equal to the square root of one. That's definitely less than the square root of three. And the square root of three is definitely less than the square root of four, which is equal to two. So yeah, square root of three is in the middle. It's about 1.7, just so you know. So let's look at evaluating this, the trig functions of the angle pi over six. In fact, I want you all to write down what sine of pi over six is, what cosine of pi over six is, and what tangent of pi over six is. Again, I'll remind you, we have good old, if you like, so, uh, so. We got time. All right. There's your sine, cosine, and tangent value. Sine is one half. I should say sine of pi over six is one half. Cosine of pi over six is root three over two. Tangent of pi over six is root three over two. And I want to point out specifically for sine and cosine the value switched from before, right? When the angle was pi over three, sine was root three over two and cosine was one half. When the angle was pi over six, now sine is one half and cosine is root three over two. It's not a coincidence that these just switch. When you have angles that are complementary that add up to 90 degrees, the sine and cosine, or actually any co-functions, the values will interchange. So sine and cosine will switch, tangent and cotangent will switch, and secant and cosecant will switch from what they were before. And they will. If we write down cosecant here, cosecant of pi over six is two. Secant of pi over six is gonna be two over root three, which we should just rationalize as two root three over three. And cotangent of pi over six, here's a good lesson to learn. Don't write it as three over root three, because then you have to rationalize that. Write it as root three over one, which is just root three. So definitely flip the thing that has the ras the irrational thing in the denominator if you can see that. And again, I'll point out, these are just the previous values interchanged, right? 
sine and cosine interchanged, tangent and cotangent interchanged, cosecant and secant interchanged. And that is always going to be the case for complementary angles, which we see mostly in this 30 degree and 60 degree situation or pi over three, pi over six situation. Um, yeah, okay, the last one, finally. Finally, the last one, which is the easier one in my opinion, the 45, 45, 90 triangle, or 45 being pi over four, pi over four, pi over two. This is also called an isosceles right triangle. So whenever someone says isosceles right triangle, they mean a 45, 45, 90, because the only right triangle that can be isosceles where two of the sides have the same length means these two sides have to be the same. These two legs have to be the same. And the angles there have to be 45 degrees or pi over 80. There is no other choice. Um, people do this in a couple of different ways. I like to call these side lengths one and then use the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing hypotenuse length. So here, one squared plus one squared equals the unknown side squared. One plus one is two. And then if we take the square root of both sides, we get the missing side to be the square root of two. Really, you could take any multiple of these sides. So some people like to do this and say, instead they have a triangle that looks like this. They like to do their triangle as root two, root two, and two. If you multiply all of these sides by the square root of two, what's one times the square root of two? And what's the square root of two times the square root of two? Right, so these triangles are what are called similar triangles. They have the same angles, but different lengths. But they still give you the same trig function values because trig functions are just ratios. They're literally just this side divided by that side. And it doesn't matter if you multiply all the sides by the same thing. If you divide two sides together, the, the factors you multiply each side by are just gonna cancel out. So if I wanna find sine of pi over four, that's just gonna be opposite over hypotenuse or opposite over hypotenuse. The nice thing about this triangle is you're already gonna get the rationalized answer. But if I start here, if I get one over root two, then I have to multiply by root two over root two to rationalize it. Cosine, this is what I love about pi over four, cosine and sine are the same. That is the best thing I think that to remember when I think about pi over four, is that the sine value and the cosine value are the same value. So cosine and pi over four is also root two over two. And then if cosine and sine have the same value, then tangent has to equal what? Well, tangent is opposite over adjacent or sine over cosine. If those are the same, it has to be one. And now the reciprocals. Cosecant of pi over four is the reciprocal of this, but let's do the reciprocal of that. The reciprocal of one over root two is root two over one. Same deal for secant. Secant of pi over four is also root two over one. And cotangent of pi over four is also one. So those are trig functions of values that I think you're probably expected to reasonably know. Okay, so let's, there's a couple of things I wanna say about this. So give me my circles back. They're, they're right there. Here's what I want to point out about this. And if I put, finally put my, yes, ruler type, cool. So let's try and make this look pretty good here. Yeah. So eh, that could have been better. I was trying to go for a 45 degree angle there. That doesn't look, I got lots of circles. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> right down there, sorry. So can I, can I get a 45 degree angle? Maybe, sure, that's about right. But what I really want to point out is this line that makes the 45 degree angle here, or the pi over four degrees, that line is the line y equals x, right? The straight line with the slope of one, which isn't surprising then that on the line y equals x, the cosine value and the sine value AKA the X coordinate and the Y coordinate are the same because they're on the line where Y and X are equal to each other. So that's another way of seeing that, oh yeah, 
on this line, cosine and sine should be the same. And they are. They're both root 2 over 2. I don't want to say a whole lot about the unit circle because it gets kind of bogged down. But what I want to point out is in this first quadrant, down here, which coordinate is bigger? If I like pick a point right there, is the X coordinate larger or is the Y coordinate larger? Well, have I gone further right or further up? I've definitely gone further right, right? I've gone this much right and only this much up because I'm under the line Y equals X. And if I'm under the line Y equals X, the X coordinate is larger than the Y coordinate. So when I look at the angle of like, say, why not use a ruler, James? Good question. Why not? When I look at, say, the angle like pi over six or 30 degrees, I'm thinking, well, I know it's either x cosine is root three over two or and sine is one half or vice versa. Cosine is one half and sine is root three over two. But if I know that over here, the x value should be larger than the y value, I know that the cosine value should be bigger than the sine value. So over here, I'm getting the cosine value to be root three over two and the sine value to be one half. Because I know that root three is bigger than one. How much is root three? About 1.7. So root three over two is definitely bigger than one over two. And then on the flip side, man, where's my red pen? There it is. Up here, at an angle, say pi over three, Now we have the opposite thing happening. Now we have a case where the sine value is bigger and the cosine value is smaller. So up here, you're getting cosine of pi over three, comma sine of pi over three, which is gonna give you a one half comma root three over two. We'll talk about two more angles and then we'll talk about a fun way to remember them. Fun being relative speaking. So. This is a unit circle, meaning the radius is one. So if we go one to the right, we're at the point one comma zero. And the angle there is zero degrees or zero radius. So I will point out, when we talk about the unit circle, when we talk about measuring angles, we're always measuring from the positive x-axis. So you go over to the right, and then that's where your angle starts. So zero radians, 90 degrees or pi over two radians, 180 degrees or pi radians, 270 degrees, degrees. And we could say that, well, this coordinate one zero is cosine of zero radians, comma, sine of zero radians. And then up here at pi over two radians, the point is zero comma one. So up here we have that cosine of pi over two is equal to zero and sine of pi over two is equal to one. So these five values, these five angles, there's a really kind of clever way of remembering what they are. So here is the clever way. Some people will use their hands for this. I'm not good at doing it with my hand, but I'll try to show you the hand way after I tell it five this. So let's write down our five angles in order from smallest to biggest. So we've got zero, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, pi over two. And let's talk about sine, sine of theta, and this is theta. So sine of zero is zero. I'm gonna write it in a kind of funky way then. I'm gonna write it as the square root of zero divided by two, which sure is equal to zero. Because the square root of zero is zero, zero divided by two is still zero. For pi over six, sine is equal to one half. But I'm gonna write it as the square root of one over two, which is just one half. For sine of pi over four, it's root two over two. For sine of pi over three, it's root three over two. And for sine of pi over two, it's, well, following the pattern, square root of zero over two, square root of one over two, square root of two over two, square root of three over two, it's gonna be the square root of four over two but the square root of four is two and two divided by two is one. So here's kind of a slick pattern for remembering the sine values of the important angles in the first quadrant. And then cosine does the opposite stuff. Cosine of theta, you get 
root four over two, which is one, and then root three over two, and then root two over two, and then one half, which is root one over two, and then root zero over two. They literally just flip the order and what you get them. So in the first quadrant, as the sine values get bigger, the cosine values get smaller. And then if you really wanted to, you could just find tangent of theta by doing sine divided by cosine. So tangent of zero is zero divided by one, which is zero. Tangent of pi over six is one half over root three over two, which is one over root three, root three over three. Tangent of pi over four is root two over two divided by root two over two is one. Tangent of pi over three is root three over one, which is root three. And finally, tangent of pi over two is one over zero, so it's undefined. When you say prove them, what do you like? What do you mean? I don't right. So yes, so that, that's an excellent question. I don't think anyone's ever going to ask you to justify that tangent of pi over three is equal to the square root of three. I think that is knowledge you are permitted to just have. So if you know how to find sine, cosine, tangent, and by extension, cosecant, secant, and cotangent of an angle, I don't think you need to prove to anyone that you know you've got the right thing. Yeah, I think you're just, it's like, it's like saying like three plus two is five, right? No one's gonna like ask you, how did you know that? You'd be like, yeah, you did the thing. So same is true for evaluating trig function angles. For any of these typical angles that show up on the unit circle, no one's gonna be like, oh, how'd you get that? They'd be like, yeah, they got it or they made a mistake. Um, to kind of say one more thing about this, when we go to other quadrants, for example, if I wanted to find cosine of five pi over six, this is where we use the idea of reference angles. The nice thing about special angles, which these are all special angles, they're the ones that we know how to find sine, cosine, tangent of relatively easy using triangles or the unit circle. You can essentially say, well, cosine of five pi over six has the same reference angle, which means the angle measured to the x-axis as pi over six. If I draw five pi over six, which looks like that, it's almost a whole pi, but I'm missing a pi over six. So there's my angle of five pi over six. And watch here real quick. Here's my reference angle measured to the which axis? Always the x-axis, never ever the other one. I'm not even going to say it. Always to the x-axis when you're drawing reference angle. So you're either dropping down to the x-axis or dropping up to the x-axis if you're below the x-axis. So that angle there is pi over six because five pi over six plus pi over six gets me one whole pi. Uh, and what is cosine of pi over six? Well, cosine of pi over six is the square root of three over two. So cosine of five pi over six is going to be Square root of three over two, except it might be negative. And it is negative because over on the left side of the y-axis, the x values are negative, right? You've gone where on the negative side for x. So this is negative root three over two. In a similar way, if I asked for, do I have enough room here? I probably have enough room here. Sine of, sure, five pi over four. Well, five pi over four is more than pi. Right, it's five quarters of pi, or one pi and one more quarter of pi. So I'm going one whole pi and then pi over four more. And just by saying the pi over four more part, I've already kind of said what my reference angle is. My reference angle is pi over four. We know that sine of pi over four is positive root two over two. So sine of five pi over four, well, since I'm in a quadrant where I'm below the x-axis, that means the y value is negative. So sine's gonna be negative. You don't have to look at the quadrant stuff because there's an easier way. There's a mnemonic device. There's actually two mnemonic devices. So we'll do one, we'll, we'll do, yeah, we'll, we'll go back to, no more surf, I don't need you anymore. So just to kind of not wrap this up, but to kind of move on to the next kind of part of today, talking about trig, if I wanted to find, tangent of five pi over six, I'd be like, okay, well, my reference angle is pi over six. And the nice thing about these special angles is you don't actually have to draw it. 
you can just look at the frac, especially if it's written in radians, you can look at the fraction and essentially ignore the thing that is multiplying the pi on top. So if I see five pi over six, reference angle is pi over six. If I saw, I don't know, cosine of, sure, five pi over three, I don't even have to look at the five, I know it's pi over three. This trick only works for these special angles measured in radians. So anything with a pi over six, a pi over four, or a pi over three. Anything else is no good. Like for example, if I said, what's the reference angle for seven pi over nine radians, it's not gonna be just pi over nine. It's gonna be two pi over nine. So if you draw seven pi over nine, you're like right over there, you didn't go a full pi. It's always really just how much more you need to get to a full pi or a full two pi or how much less you need. So right there, my reference angle would be, oh, I need two pi over nine there. Because seven pi over nine plus two pi over nine is nine pi over nine plus one pi over three. But for the nice angles that we usually deal with, it's really easy. You can say, okay, the reference angle here is pi over six. The reference angle here is pi over three. I know the tangent of pi over six. Do I know what tangent of pi over six is? I know it's either root three or root three over three. I know that pi over six is smaller than 45 degrees. So it's where y is smaller than x and tangent is the y over the x. So it can be smaller than one. So it'd be root three over three. You don't have to do it the way I do it, but you have to figure out a way for your own self to know how to find the trick functions. But then tangent of five pi over six, hmm, it's either gonna be positive or negative of the same value. So I know it's gonna be either plus or minus root three over three. How do I figure it out? With a mnemonic device. Quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. And what do we say? You guys know what we say? Sure, that's the less, that's the less spicy one. All students, Take calculus. What does that mean for us? It means that in quadrant one, all the trig functions are positive. In quadrant two, sine is positive, and the other two primary ones, cosine and tangent, are negative. What can I say about the reciprocals? Same. So that's a, and that's actually a very good broad statement to make. Reciprocals always carry the same plus or minus sign. If you take a negative number and take the reciprocal of it, it's still negative. One divided by negative two, still negative. Same thing with positive, right? If you take the reciprocal of positive, still positive. So we don't really talk about cosecant, secant, and cotangent because we know that if sine is negative, cosecant is also negative. If cosine is positive, secant is also positive. If tangent is positive or negative, cotangent is similarly positive or negative. So in the second quadrant here, sine is positive, the other two are negative, meaning in quadrant two, which this angle certainly is in, tangent of five pi over six is going to be negative root three over three. In a similar way, five pi over three, the reference angle is pi over three. We know cosine of pi over three, that's the bigger angle, so cosine is the smaller value. And then cosine of five pi over three. Well, five pi over three is in quadrant. Here's a nice way to remember it. You just count up the ones that don't reduce. One pi over three is in quadrant one. Two pi over three is in quadrant two. Three pi over three reduces. We skip it. It's equal to pi. It's not in any quadrant. Actually, the angles that are on the axes are not in any quadrant. Four pi over three is in quadrant three. Five pi over three is in quadrant four. So five pi over three is in quadrant four and cosine is positive in quadrant four. So that's gonna be a positive one half. It works for the other angles too. Pi over six in quadrant one is, is the reference angle. And then the next one is not two pi over six, which reduces, not three pi over six, which reduces, not four pi over six, which reduces, but five pi over six. Five pi over six. And then six pi over six reduces. Seven pi over six doesn't reduce. That's the next one in quadrant three. Eight pi over six, nine pi over six, 10 pi over six. 11 pi over six doesn't reduce in quadrant four. It's kind of annoying, but like that's one way that will for sure work. It also works for the pi over fours. Pi over four doesn't reduce. Quadrant one, two pi over four reduces pi over three. Three pi over four doesn't, that's quadrant two. Four pi over four, five pi over four doesn't reduce, six pi does, seven pi over four doesn't. So that's one way you can list all the 
angles in each quadrant that have the same reference angle, either pi over three, pi over four, pi over six. I know it's kind of a lot, but it's kind of a lot. I thought that, there's nothing else to say. It's kind of a lot. In case you're curious, I won't write it down, but the other mnemonic device for remembering this is all strippers take cash. So if you want to remember it that way instead, it's 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 a little more memorable than all students take calculus, but all students take calculus is also memorable, but not true. Not all students take calculus. All of you are taking calculus, but I think Davis, not all students take calculus. Some of them don't have to take any math at all. It's only like, you like 70, 70, 75 ish percent of, of all majors at Davis do have to take some amount of calculus, but there's some lesser percentage that don't. What time have we got here? All right. So evaluating trig functions, we should talk about the graphs of the trig functions. Um, the ones I think you really need to know are sine and cosine, which we did talk a little bit about, a little bit about last time. Let's draw them again, just so we have them in our wheelhouse here. So let's draw sine first. So when I think about graphing sine, I don't want to plot every value of sine, right? You could be like, plot, you know, letting the angles be zero and pi over six and pi over four and pi over three and pi over two and pi, and right, and just go through all the angles in each of the quadrants. But really what we typically do is we draw what I call my, my unit circle with the four corners here. Again, you don't have to do this if you're familiar with how to draw a sign, but if you're not, I like doing this. Oh, that's terrible here. And then the angles are of course, zero radians, pi over two radians, pi radians, three pi over two radians, and one full revolution or one period of the sine function is going to go from zero radians to two pi radians. So I usually like to mark off where I'm going to end my two pi, like about there. And then I like to cut it in half and then cut each of those in half. That's to me the easiest way to kind of equally space them out. That's where pi lives, that's where pi over two lives, that's where three pi over two lives. My y-axis scale is probably a little larger than it should be when I draw it. Pi over two is about 1.5, but I usually make my mark about the same height up. Really, it should be, that's, that's a probably a little bit better. That's close, but again, I probably exaggerated my y-axis a little bit. No one's checking. Okay, for a zero radian, sign, the sine value is zero. For pi over two radians, the sine value is one. I'm just looking at the y coordinate. For pi radians, the sine value is zero. For three pi over two radians, the sine value is negative one. And finally, for two pi radians, the sine value is zero again. And we get this lovely sinusoidal graph. Just the name for the sine or the cosine graph is sinusoidal. Looks great. Oh, there's a question or a comment for something. Let's see what's in the chat. Could we go over the chain rule again? So I would say we haven't actually gone over it yet. Um, we're definitely not there yet, though. So I think we need to talk about the product and the question before we can talk about the chain rule. We will. I will do what I can. So um, we might we we might be able to pull off getting there. We'll see. Oh, was there something else in the chat too? Okay, sounds good. Right on. Um, so let's look at. So here is the graph of sine. The graph of cosine looks virtually the same. Actually, one way to think about the graph of cosine is just the sine graph shifted pi over two to the left. In fact, it is literally true that if you take the sine graph and shift it pi over two to the left, if I want to shift to the left, do I add or subtract on the inside of the function? Hmm. I add. Sine of x plus pi over two is literally equal to cosine of x. This is shifted left by pi over two. And that's going to give you exactly the cosine graph. Let's see. In fact, we can actually check on the unit circle. Ah, that's kind of great. You guys like, let's pull it here. But it's really kind of neat. Check it out. You'll, see, you'll get to actually see the things that me just telling you it's true. So cosine of zero is one, and then cosine of pi over two is zero, and then cosine of pi is negative one, three pi over two, two back to zero, and cosine of two pi is one. For these sine and cosine graphs, you always have this pattern of, of y values of, I usually, I don't really say the way I say it, one, zero, negative one, zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, right? It just kind of goes like that. I think of it as really top, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, right? You're just going top, 
to the middle, the bottom. Where if you're at the top or the bottom, you go back to the middle. If you've just been in the bottom before, you go to the top. If you've just been in the top, you go back to the middle, bottom. So the top, middle, bottom, middle, top, middle, bottom, middle, top. It's just this whole same pattern every time. And then if you want to check instead, if x was zero, sine of pi over two is one. If x is pi over two, pi over two plus pi over two is pi, sine of pi is zero. If x is pi, sine of three pi over two is negative one. If x is three pi over two, sine of two pi gets you back to zero. And finally, if x is two pi, two pi plus pi over two is a coterminal angle of pi over two. Just means you end up on the same place on the unit circle and you get a value of one. So literally you get the same value when you plug in the x. Kind of neat. Here's what cosine looks like. Ooh, kind of. Okay. Sine and cosine. Not too shocking. Um, they are essentially the same. Something else to say here. Sure, a couple words here. Things to think about here. The domain for sine and cosine is everything. And they're usually the, they're the only two trig functions that are defined and continuous everywhere. The range is from negative one to one, which is definitely a useful piece of information that gets used more often than you would think. Um, I guess I should say they are continuous and differentiable on the entire domain, as are most functions. Most functions are continuous and differentiable on their domains, meaning where they are defined. Uh, something else to say here. Oh. When you think of continuous, like very generically, you just think of a graph that doesn't have any like weird jumps or discontinuities, no breaks, as I like to say. When you think of differentiable, you should think of a graph that is smooth. There's no pointy points. There's no corners, there's no cusps. A really good example of a graph that isn't smooth is the absolute value graph. But the absolute value graph definitely has a sharp corner. It is not differentiable there. This graph is smooth everywhere, differentiable everywhere. All right. Time. Okay. Yeah, time. Time waits for another one. Let's draw the other four trig functions and we'll finally, I think, get around talking about some derivatives and answering that question that I asked way back when, which was the equation of the tangent line, which I know we like kind of grab out. So, how do you graph secant and cosecant by graphing sine and cosine? At least that's how I do it. So, if I wanted to graph cosecant of x, which is the reciprocal of sine of x, here's how I would do it. I would give myself a sine graph, or at least think about what a sine graph would give me. So if I do the usual kind of two pi thing, break it up there, there, and there, I might go to the negative side as well. I might go maybe one or two values to the left and say negative pi over two, negative pi. I know that sine of zero is zero, sine of pi over two is one, sine of pi is zero, Sine of three pi over two is negative one. Sine of two pi is zero. And sine of negative pi over two would also be negative one. And sine of negative pi would be zero. So if sine is equal to zero, then the reciprocal of sine is going to be undefined. Right? One over zero, division by zero is no good, right? Undefined. So I know that when the sine values are zero, the cosecant graph is going to have vertical asymptotes. There's one there. I don't want to draw a vertical axis and turn on the y-axis because I don't need to. So that's where I usually start. Is all the zeros for sine correspond to vertical asymptotes for cosecant. And then if sine is equal to one, like if sine of pi over two is equal to one, cosecant of pi over two is equal to one over one, which is still one. And similarly, if it was negative, Cosecant would be negative. So these plot points I plotted here actually are points on my cosecant graph, which is why I plotted them. But now here's the deal. And this is where things I think are really easy once you've done it a couple of times. If sine is getting smaller, closer and closer to zero, one divided by sine is going to get larger. One divided by a very, very small number blows up as we've seen before. So like right here, as my sine values would be getting closer and closer to zero, my cosecant values are going to get larger and larger and larger. Same over here. As my sine values would get closer and closer to zero, my cosecant values are going to get larger and larger and larger. 
But over here, the same thing happens, except I'm going to say negatively large. So as my sine values get closer and closer to zero, but are negative, my cosecant values are going to get largely negative. Same deal over here. Or as I like to kind of say, the cosecant graph or the reciprocal graph is kind of like the sine graph, but you're flipping the graph away from the x-axis. So sine would do this, cosecant flips away. Like I'm flipping it kind of over or away. Same deal down here, sine would do this, cosecant flips it away. Over here, same deal, cosecant flips it away. Some people like to say, although I discourage you from saying this, that these are parabolas. They're definitely not parabolas. They kind of have a look that is similar-ish to a parabola, but they're definitely not parabolas because parabolas don't have vertical asymptotes. But I know it, I, I definitely want to say that. Didn't I? So it's okay to say, oh, yeah, they're kind of like parabolas, but they're not parabolas. So there's your cosecant graph. We can do the same thing for secant, right? If I want to graph secant, same idea. I'm going to first graph cosine, or at least think about what cosine would do. Always, always with the smearing. Oh, by the way, I don't think I'm going to lose power here. I'm probably just jinxing myself right now, but I didn't have my power cord with me today. I left it at home. So if for some reason we lose power, I apologize and and you'll get as much as you get. So if it, if if it suddenly things go blank, you should be like, oh, class is open. So I haven't gotten a warning yet, but I'm just, you know, we're getting close to the end of time here. So could happen. Hopefully I find someone's to borrow for my next class. Otherwise I'm going to be in trouble. Okay, so for cosine, same deal. I'm just going to graph my usual cosine, but I was just thinking about what my cosine graph looked like. So I know that cosine of zero is one, cosine of pi over two is zero, cosine of pi is negative one, three pi over two is zero, two pi is one, and then zero, negative one. And the same idea holds. Whenever cosine is equal to zero, oh, no, yeah, whenever cosine is equal to zero, secant's going to be undefined. So that those zeros for cosine are just telling me where my vertical asymptotes are because for secant. And so then I'm going to do this kind of deal. Just flipping away from the x-axis instead of going towards the x-axis. Secant and cosecant are not too terrible to graph. Yeah. Um, so would you say, like, for example, we get like secant pi over two? It would just be like a variation. Of Whoa. Like, so are the are you being asked to find the value of secant of pi over three, or you're being asked to graph secant of? You wouldn't okay. be asked to graph secant of pi over three. Okay. So like secant of like some. Right, so 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 the difference is if you're asked to find secant of a specific angle, then your answer is just a number. Whereas if they say graph secant of like 2x, then you're supposed to graph the graph and the two is going to squish it in this way. Okay. Which I know we haven't talked about any sort of transformations because I'm kind of not talking about that. Okay. Um, so yeah, but be, so the, the instructions should be relatively clear. They'll either say graph this thing or evaluate or find for just finding the value. Um, we might as well finish this off and talk about tangent and cotangent. Graphing tangent and cotangent are kind of annoying in my opinion, actually. So for y equal to tangent, I'm thinking of it as sine, excuse me, over cosine. I'm kind of thinking back to those first quadrant values we did for tangent before, where I know that for x being zero, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, and pi over two, tangent, of zero is zero, tangent of pi over six is one over root three, which is root three over three, tangent of pi over four is one, tangent of pi over four, pi over three is root three, and tangent of pi over two is undefined. Because for the same reason as secant having a vertical asymptote at pi over two, right? Secant, vertical asymptote at pi over two, because when cosine is zero, you're dividing by zero, you get a vertical asymptote. You're also going to get a vertical asymptote here at pi over two, because if cosine of pi over two is zero, we're going to be dividing by zero. So when we graph tangent, we get a vertical asymptote at pi over two. And every odd multiple of pi over two. That's where cosine is going to be zero. So vertical asymptote there, vertical asymptote there, vertical asymptote there. 
And really when I actually graph tangent, like if I'm just doing for myself, I'm gonna say that tangent of pi over four is one. I'm kind of in, kind of going to kind of ignore these two values here. And in a similar way, tangent of negative pi over four is negative one. And so we have this kind of shape here. People like to say it kind of looks like, at least this part kind of looks like y equals x cubed. Again, kind of. Not really though, because y equals x cubed really flattens out at the origin and tangent really does not. That is not, does not flatten out like, like x cubed there. And that is because it doesn't. Because of the derivative of tangent is not equal to zero at that point, it's really why it doesn't. And then this one up here, and then over here. Oops, sorry, I went way too far there. So there's kind of a candy graph. And for completeness sake, we might as well throw in cotangent there. Cotangent, which is cosine x over sine x, has the same sort of look, except now my asymptotes are where the asymptotes for cosecant work. So instead of at pi over two and three pi over two and five pi over two and negative pi over two, they're gonna be at the multiples of pi. So zero and pi and two pi and three pi, just like for cosecant. So we graph this one. I could have I could have tried to line this up. We could pretend like I did. So now my asymptotes are at pi and at zero and at two pi and at negative pi. Tangent, sorry, tangent of pi over four is one, cotangent of pi over four is also one. They're reciprocals. Three pi over four is in quadrant two, and in quadrant two, tangent and cotangent are both negative. So over here, you're gonna get a negative one. So this one actually, instead of going up from left to right, goes down from left to right, but it has the same shape. And it just repeats itself over and over. Yeah, so there are the graphs of tangent and cotangent. And here's what I'll say about them. They're continuous and differentiable, just like secant and cosecant, on their domains, meaning wherever they're defined. So for tangent, wherever you don't have an odd multiple of pi over two, for cotangent, wherever you don't have a multiple of pi, they're the continuous and differentiable. The other thing I'll say, which I think is kind of interesting, is tangent is an odd function. And you can see the geometry there. In fact, you can actually see it by looking. If I flip this over, does it look the same? I, I shouldn't say flip over. I should say if I rotate it, does it look the same? Yeah, it looks the same. So does cotangent, which is kind of weird. But cotangent, right, if you look at it here, if you flip around the origin, still looks the same. So those are both odd functions. On the other hand, Um, cosecant is also odd because if you flip around, if you rotate around the origin, still looks the same. But secant does not. Secant has reflective symmetry across the y-axis. So I can't flip it over. Well, I mean, maybe you can kind of see through the paper there. No, not really. You can kind of see through the paper there. You try really hard. No, not. Um, so secant is an even function, just like cosine. So cosine and secant are the only two even trigonometric functions. The other four sine, cosecant, tangent, cotangent are all odd trigonometric functions. All right, so I think that's a pretty good dive into trigonometry as far as, yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Like graphing like functions and tangent functions like tangent functions like the intercepts, yeah, all right. So if I were to have to graph something like, give me an example. Yeah. Um, would be two cosine and then pi x over three. Oh, pi, yeah, that's terrible. Sorry, not, not, no. Yeah. So, so I don't love, I'm not a fan of ones where you have a multiple of pi in there because then it makes your, it makes your period atypical in my opinion, but that's fine. So here what we say is the amplitude is two. That means we're going to subvert, we're going to have a vertical stretch by a factor of two, and our period is going to be 
2 pi divided by pi over 3. Always divided by the coefficient of x. That's 2 pi times 3 over pi, which is 6. So here's how I would graph this. I'm going to take my usual cosine graph. And fortunately, there is no horizontal shift here. So my new period, instead of being from 0 to 2 pi, now it's going to be from 0 to 6. So I'm going to go to 6. And then just like before, I'm going to cut that in half. And I'm going to cut that in half again. Half of 3 is, you can either write 3 halves or 1.5. And then between 3 and 6, you can literally take the average of those two numbers. How do you average two numbers? Add them together and divide by 2. 3 plus 6 is 9. 9 divided by 2 is 9 divided by 2. Or if you like decimals, 4.5. So those are my five usual points I'm plotting on my cosine graph. I know cosine starts at a height of 1 normally. Cosine of 0 is 1. But now I'm multiplying that by 2. So instead of starting at 1, I'm going to start at 2. So cosine starts at the top, then goes to the middle, then goes to the bottom back to the middle, back to the top. That's how I would grab this one. Yeah. I think there's a blank down. I'm sorry. That's all right. How did you get the x values again? So I got the x values. So, so I didn't write them down. But the way I'm actually getting my x values is the following way. So I'm, first of all, I will point out there's no phase shift, aka horizontal shift. It's called a phase shift when you're talking about trig functions, though. Why? I don't know. Which means we're going to start at zero. So my first x value is zero. And the way I find the rest of the x values is I take my period and I divide it into four quarters or four quadrants. Because when we graph this, right, the five important points we find are at the first quadrantal angle, zero, and then the next pi over two, and then pi, and then three pi over two, and then two pi. Those are the five points that just break up the whole period into four equal quarters or four equal quadrants. So I'm taking that whole period length from zero to six and dividing it into four equal length segments. Well, my period divided by four is six divided by four, which is three halves. So my starting point is zero because I didn't shift left or right. My next point is zero plus three halves. My next point is the previous point plus three halves. My next point is the previous point, plus three halves. My next point is the previous point, plus three halves, which should get me to the end of my period, it does. So that's the more kind of algorithmic way of doing it, is like you start with the first thing, you just keep adding a quarter of a period four times, and if you add four quarters, you get to the end of the period. The more kind of just doing it way of doing it is be like, well, I'm gonna take my period, and if it's from zero to wherever, it's easy to take that number and cut it in half, and then cut those each in half again. Let's do one more like that, which I will design to be more to my liking. So let's say we want to graph y equal to three sine of no, no phase. Do you have you guys talked about shifting left and right? Cool, good, because it's kind of annoying, but it's fine. But like it's annoying. Um, let's do, or I guess that can be fine. Sorry, let's do three fourths x. Yeah, that's fine. Plus minus one. Cool. Okay, so amplitude is three. And let's make it negative three sign. Amplitude is still three. Amplitude is always a positive number. It's kind of like distance. You're just saying how far are we going above or below the middle. The vertical shift down one because of that negative one down there. We're going to all the y values are going to be one less than they would have been. And then the period. So the new period is two pi divided by the coefficient of x, which is going to be two pi times four over three, which is eight pi over three. So I'm going to talk about doing it both ways. So the easy way, if I cut 8 pi over 3 in half, half of 8 pi over 3 is 4 pi over 3. Half of that is 2 pi over 3. And then the average of 4 pi over 3 and 8 pi over 3, well, if I add those together, 8 pi plus 4 pi is 12 pi over 3. 
And if I divide that by two, I get six pi over three, which I know is two pi. But I also recommend when you're doing this, either this way or the other way, to not reduce your fractions. The other way I can do this is my first point is zero, and then my period divided by four, well, eight pi over three divided by four is two pi over three. So if I just take that and add two pi over three, I get two pi over three. Uh -oh, I'm about to lose power. If I add two pi over three again, hold on, what time have I got? Mm, five more minutes, so it's not looking good. So if I keep adding two pi over three, four pi over three, and if I add two pi over three again, I get six pi over three. And if I add, two, right, and I'm not gonna reduce that even though I know it's two pi, because I'm still gonna add two pi over three again and get eight pi over three, which I should because that's how long my period is. And then what I like to do when I graph this is since I'm shifting down one, I like to think of negative one as the new kind of middle. And then my amplitude says go one, two, three above that and one, two, three below that. Sign, you make your normal sign graph, the signs start in the middle or at the top or at the bottom? The middle. Ah, 